All right, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you to the Jubilee Center. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, thank you so much for an opportunity both to, to write another paper and to think through these things, but also to have a platform to have a dialogue about them. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, and so what I'd like to do just really briefly before we have a discussion is to outline the pa paper briefly, because I know some people may not have read it before today, um, and then to tell a couple of stories about what brought me to, to think about this issue and why I think it's really important, and then finally to hopefully draw together a couple conclusions about this issue uh, for us to think about together. So the paper itself, you'll notice there are three kind of broad sections that I um, broke the paper into. The first is a consideration really briefly, much too briefly, um, on the topic of conscience in liberal political thought. Um, and so, uh, in, in liberal political thought, broadly speaking, um, I perceive conscience as primarily being about a psychological state or a bundle of certain values held by the individual. So it's not a substantive idea, um, it's not connected to any uh, specific moral standard or moral claim, but the idea in liberalism is that we respect whatever an individual's core values happen to be. Um, that's the kind of primary thing. It's much more nuanced than that, obviously, and much more divergent, but that's the central idea. Um, and secondly, I talked about the, the biblical idea of, of conscience, which I, I think is distinct. And so the thing I focused on there, I, I talked about several passages, especially in Paul's writings. Paul uses the word um, conscience around 30 times in his uh, in his letters. Um, so it's a very central component of his kind of moral theology. And what I noticed there is that it is a set of values and it is a set of psychological states, so guilt feelings and feelings of approval and things like this. But those are instrumental toward our uh, obedience to God's law. So even though it is an emotional state and a psychological state. It has some end, which is <coughs> helping us to achieve God's will for us uh, and his will for the world. So um, we'll come back to that later, but you notice that in Scripture, conscience is, is tied to a substantive notion of, of the good, um, which we find in God's law. And then the final thing I did in the paper is I uh, focused on different views of conscientious objection that flow out of these two conceptions of, of conscience. So broadly speaking, in liberalism, it seems that um, one way, at least popularly in our culture, that we think about conscientious objection uh, is keeping one's hands clean, right? Uh, keeping oneself from kind of having the, the guilt feelings is an ultimate good. Um, so, again, avoiding psychological feelings of a certain kind or being allowed to maintain one's core values, whatever those happen to be. Right? Um, <clears throat> but when it comes to the Christian notion of, of conscientious objection, I think we can say there is a, a Christian notion. I think it's more about bearing witness, two things, bearing witness to the truth, the moral truth uh, of God's law, and secondly, uh, and Paul is very big on this in Romans 14, it's about submitting to the ultimate judgment of Christ, right? So anytime we conscientiously object to a demand of the state or an employer or whatever else, um, <clears throat> we do this out of an acknowledgement that our ultimate judge is Christ, right? And at, at uh, his coming, every knee will bow. Um, and so that's how... Paul seems to construct his, his argument for uh, both acting according to our own conscience and respecting the consciences of others. Now, uh, of course, this paper was published about a year ago, and it was in the middle of all the row about um, same-sex marriage and Irish bakers and all these things on, in the headlines. But actually, that wasn't what brought me to consider this topic. Um, it, it may have implications for those things, but primarily... I had two things in mind, uh, and the first thing is uh, the abortion law in, in this country, and especially the uh, conscientious objection 
clause in the 1967 legislation. And recently, some of you may, may know about this, but there have been uh, shifts in the interpretation of that law. So two midwives in um, Glasgow working for a hospital in the NHS um, were basically the ruling has come out now that they um, they don't have the right to conscientiously refuse to do things like supervising the abortion or telling someone to carry out a termination. Um, they only have rights when it comes to the termination itself, right? Um, whereas it, the law itself and, and the wording um, seemed to protect any conscientious objection to treatment provided by this act, right? So that might include things like um, supervising or preoperative or postoperative care or whatever. Um, so I see that as a very big shift, and I think that's because we have two different conceptions of conscience working um, in terms of interpreti interpretation of the law. So I think that's the first thing that pushed me to it. And the second thing is, is an example from philosophy. Um, and this is from the work of Bernard Williams, who's a moral philosopher of the late 20th century. Hugely influential. And um, he has an idea of integrity. So integrity is one of his um, irreducible, irreducible values in his, his moral philosophy. Um, <clears throat> and he gives an example, I'll just go over it briefly, of a famous example of um, two characters, one named Jim and one uh, named Pedro. And Jim comes across this Mexican village. Uh, it's a thought experiment. Jim comes across this village, and Pedro's lined up uh, 20 Native Americans against the wall to be shot. And Pedro is this kind of maniacal figure. And uh, Jim, uh, when he walks into the village, is told he can take the life of one of the Mexicans himself, one of the Native Americans himself, or Pedro will take the life of all of them, right? And so Williams says, well, Jim in this situation has two things to consider. Um, Jim might be, and he even does say Jim is a utilitarian. So Jim thinks that it's the consequences of actions that matter exclusively. So Jim believes morally the right thing to do is to shoot the one Native American. But William says basically that Jim also has to consider his own integrity as an irreducible value, right? So um, Williams talks about how Jim may not be able to live with himself after committing this act, even though he thinks it's morally right. Now, uh, the point of this example, I think, is to, to draw this distinction clearly between uh, integrity and conscience. And I think integrity as Williams conceives of it, is replacing our notion of conscience and contemporary liberalism gradually. What I mean by that is Williams can say that integrity is an irreducible value, so one's psychological response to having to do something is an ultimate value that can trump uh, the, the morality of, of the state of affairs. Whereas, I think conscience or integrity in the, the broad swath of Christian tradition has never been just about uh, one's guilt feelings or positive moral feelings. It's always been both um, psychological and epistemological. So it's always been about both feeling a certain way in response to an action, but also about knowing something about the morality of an action. Right? And so figures as diverse as Augustine and Aquinas and the Enlightenment figure Thomas Reed and even John Henry Newman, they all explicitly emphasize the epistemological side of conscience, that it really matters um, that the conscience is not just about feelings or emotion, it is about um, gaining access to objective moral truths. And so um, what are we to, to conclude from these things? Well, primarily, my, my reason for writing the paper is that I think we, we have to be careful um, when we think about uh, how far liberalism goes in project protecting the Christian conscience, right? And in this sense, I think um, perhaps the Glaswegian midwives are onto something by not being satisfied with the idea that they don't have to carry out the abortions themselves, right? Um, what they're pointing to is that there's an objective uh, moral law um, 
and by my taking part in the termination or whatever else, by supervising it or ordering it, I'm still part of the state of affairs that leads to something that is against God's law. Rather than primarily being focused on the fact that if I can just tell someone else to do it, then I don't have to deal with the recurring images of the procedure that I've undergone uh, or that I've, I've um, done myself, the abortion. So I think it's really important that we, we distinguish as Christians. Um, it was so fitting that you, you read that verse before we started. That um, we can form our, our conscientious kind of and our, our emotional response to situations according to God's law primarily. Um, and secondly, um, I think we need to reconceptualize as Christians and re-articulate the notion of, of conscientious objection or even... I think conscientious witness is a better way of thinking about it. It's more positive. Um, in, in these terms, that since Christ is Lord of all creation, and since he is, he is the judge of all humankind, um, it must be the case that well-formed, appropriately informed conscientious witness um, has profound potential for promoting the common good. And I think uh, we, we see that in a wide range of figures from Bonhoeffer to um, Martin Luther King Jr. and others. Um, so yeah, those, those are my conclusions and um, I know there's a lot to think about there but I'd love to throw it open to, to discussion.